Good evening everybody. How are you feeling? Must be tired at the end of the day, right? So much of information overload and sitting, sitting, sitting. This session is going to be the other way, okay? it is about relaxing. You can already start relaxing, okay? feel relaxed. So as you can see the topic is about there are mindfulness, there is leadership and leading to agility. That is the essence of this topic today. Uh, before I start, I would like to just know the profile of the class here. How many of you are managers? That means you have people reporting or you are managing people. Okay, good. Uh, how many are managers of managers? That means you have managers reporting to you. Okay, that is good. And uh, how many are like a scrum master kind of a role or a project manager? Okay, that is good. How many are coaches? Are there any coaches? Okay, that is also very good. Okay, I think that is a good profile. I, I think I almost covered many of that. Uh, little bit about myself so that you know uh, where I come from and why I am saying what I am saying today. Uh, I am in the IT industry for last maybe about 35 years. Uh, by profession, I am an electronics communication engineer and uh, did my masters in computer science from IASC. Then worked in IASC for a couple of years on research projects. Uh, then moved on to ADA, Aeronautical Development Agency. You might have heard about light combat aircraft. Uh, I worked on the avionic systems of that, very cherishable for me because it was with Abdul Kalam, he was the program director at that time. Then I moved on to the claps to Abdul Kalam, okay. <laughs> uh, and I moved on to Motorola when, the, when they started the center in India. I was with Motorola for about 8 years. In that 3 years in Singapore covering the Asia Pacific region, China, Japan, Korea, India, Singapore, on a software excellence journey for Motorola. After coming back, I joined Mindtree uh, right from the startup. I was with Mindtree for about 9 years. Uh, another wonderful journey. Uh, Ashok Sutha was my boss and Shubhrato Bakchi was my coach. Some of you might know those leaders. Uh, and growing from a startup to 10,000 people global organization, growing in seven countries, so it's a great journey. Uh, after that, wanted to do something instead of being in one company, work with multiple companies. That's how I started consulting. Uh, I'm from PM Power Consulting. We're about 20 people in Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, predominantly in agile transformation and leadership development areas. That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, something little bit about my personal interest also very relevant in this session. Uh, I like Hindustani classical music, I play tabla. Uh, I used to do a lot of gymnastics, Roman rings and parallel bars were my favorite. Uh, I like trekking, mountaineering, lot of things on western guards and Himalayas. Uh, I am a homeopathic practitioner, my brother is a homeopathic doctor so I got interested. Uh, in that process, I studied a lot about human anatomy, physiology, neurology, endocrinology, psychology, because these are all about understanding this wonderful machine that we have actually. Uh, I'm an ardent practitioner of yoga meditation since many years. Uh, I have seen tremendous impact of that on myself as well as people around me. So when you talk about leadership, I see that all these actually dots connect, because leadership is essentially about harnessing the wonderful machine that we have, the body, mind, energy, and the rest of the things manifest out of this vehicle, isn't it? So that's essentially about connects all these dots. So I would like to start with a small game now. You all have a thread with you. So what you have to do is, uh, you have to hold the thread, and once you hold it, uh, you can't shuffle your fingers. You, you can think that it is stuck with fevicol, okay? You can't move the finger and all, it's stuck, okay? Then you have to put a knot in this thread, like this, like that, and show me the knot. If anybody knows this already, don't show it to others right away, okay? Because the whole process is in the discovery. <laughs> you can start. Once you hold the thread, you can't Move your fingers, it's stuck. 
and you have to put a knot in the thread and show me the knot. <laughs> Your hand is coming in between. <laughs> almost does not look possible, right? <laughs> okay, maybe I will just do a quick demonstration, you can watch me. Uh, what you do is, put a knot in your arm first and then hold the thread. And then unwind your arms, so the knot gets transferred to the thread. You have to put a knot in your arm. Huh? Got it? Yes. It's, uh, it's a, it should be a knot, it's not knot. See? This side and this side. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, you are getting it now. Yeah, then you unwind your arm. Yep. You are not moving your fingers, right? You can play with kids as well. So, what is the significance of this? Before coming to the significance of this, have you heard about this elephant syndrome? You know, elephants in the camp, they are tied with a small thread or small rope you can say. They can easily break that, but they do not even do that. You know why? Yeah they get conditioned, you know while taming, they tie their legs with heavy chains and they struggle a lot to break the chain and they can't break the chain, iron chain and then they get conditioned, whatever tied to my leg, I can't break it. After that, even if you just tie them with a rope, they will just stand there. Very similar thing happens to us, right from our childhood, upbringing, education, work, we get conditioned in so many ways. And we think this is the only way to do things or the other way does not work. We get so many things conditioned. For this there is a psychological model called the results pyramid. What we see just like this iceberg, 10 percent is visible, 90 percent is submerged and not so visible, right? But what moves the iceberg is not the visible wind outside, it is the undercurrent which is not visible. You know that, right? Very similarly, what is visible in our manifestation is our actions and some results that happen. What is not visible is below that, what drives that action. We have certain values, principles, beliefs, experiences. For example, as a child, you might have touched fire and you get burned, that is the experience. Then your belief is fire burns. And then your values principle is do not touch fire. Then what you do? Your action is you will not touch fire. Result is you are safe, maybe. But you know there is something called cold fire. If you burn white phosphorus, it gives a blue flame and it does not burn. If you put a paper, it does not burn. If you put your finger, it does not burn. But we will not even try that because we are conditioned that fire burns. Very similar thing that thread game that we did, we talk about so much about thinking out of the box. It is not easy because we are so much boxed, which is we are conditioned so much. Deconditioning is the way to think out of the box actually, but how to do that? So, in the current world, what is called VUCA, you might have heard of this term, right? Volatile, complex, ambiguous, uncertain. That is how the world is described, very dynamically changing. So, in a VUCA world, what got you here would not get you there. That is a great book from Marshall Goldsmith. That means, what worked in the past may not necessarily work in the future. We need to constantly reinvent ourselves and the way of doing things, etcetera. 
So how do you do that? How do you get out of this cycle? How to break this cycle? Because we get conditioned in these cycles. Any idea how to break this cycle? How do you do that? Yeah, you have to change the experience because that is driving the rest of the things, right? That means you should experiment, try out. Moment you try out something, you get a new experience, then everything changes. You touch this phosphorus fire, cold fire, you will say, oh, it doesn't fur, it doesn't burn. So you have a new experience. That means there are some fire which doesn't burn. Your values principle change, then your actions results change. This is the root cause. You need to change your experience. That means you need to experiment. Agility is about experimenting, right? Otherwise, you keep debating endlessly. So, stay with this one, one part, okay? So, as we go along, you can ask me questions, uh, more of a clarification questions. If there is a debatable questions, we take it towards the end, okay? Because many things are very interrelated. You can hold on to such things. Okay, so now what coming to what is agility? If you have to not using any of this agile kind of a thing. If you have to just simply say, what is agility? What comes to your mind? Flexible, Flexible okay. Fast, fast quick, dynamic. dynamic, okay. Anything? Adaptable, yep. So I would say agility is essentially about sense and respond. You just look at this, it's just about sense and respond. How quickly can we sense the customer market needs and respond to create value? This is agility in a business context. It's just this one sentence. And it's not just this, okay? And continuously adopt to the changing context because it's not just doing once. It's actually changing and continuously adopting. I would say this is one definition of agility. Simple definition, but encompasses everything. Now, if you look at that sentence, where does agility begin? Where does agility begin? Hmm? Aha, uh -huh, okay. It begins in the mind, isn't it? It has to start with a thought. It begins in the mind. We'll go a little further and see that. And in the corporate or enterprise context, in the minds of leaders, because they are setting the strategy and the plans and the vision and setting things in motion. So it has to start with the mind in leaders. And then they should have to create similar minds in you know, cascading further down. Now look at agile mind. Agile mind is about letting go of the past, unlearning. We said agility begins in the mind, right? 50% of that is about letting go of the past, unlearning. And another 50% is embracing the new, new learning. We said sense and respond. We need to decondition ourselves, we saw that. So we have to let go of some of the past and then embrace the future. Otherwise, you'll be get stuck in the past. And if you look at these two parts, the letting go or unlearning and new learning, overcoming mental resistance and inertia is the highest challenge. Doing outside is not the challenge, actually. It's overcoming this resistance and inertia. Why this happens? Fear, insecurity, lack of motivation, energy, or lack of vision. On one hand, the resistance comes from fear, insecurity. For example, a for a change, people will say, okay, what will happen to me? Or I have been good at this, now for the new thing, I become a novice. I'm not an expert. I need to pick up something new. I'm a novice now. So what happens to my all these past credentials, credibilities? That's a fear. And it creates insecurity in the organization. 
they all create resistance. Lack of motivation, you know, you know, why should we do this? Why should we change? Lack of energy. When I say energy, it's not the physical energy so much. It's the mental energy. You know, all this change requires drive. That's that energy. Lack of vision. Am I able to visualize the future? So all this creates this mental resistance or inertia. And there is a very nice statement. You know, everything is done twice in this world. First in the mind, then in the outside world. Isn't it true? Whatever you have to do, it has to happen in the mind first, then only it can manifest in the outside world. And the challenge is the first part, doing it in the mind part. We don't pay attention to that because it is like the bottom of the iceberg, it's not visible. We tend to tackle only the visible, the top of the iceberg, which is just the 10%. Hold on to that much thought right now, okay? <laughs> any questions or any comments? Are you all okay? Okay, good. Okay, now we'll do one more game. Uh, you all have a sheet of paper. This is a timed activity, so don't do anything until I say start, okay? Everybody has this sheet? Yeah, pass one, pass two. And you need a pen or a pencil? Okay, everybody has paper and pen, right? Okay, just be there. I have to set the timer. Go to pass one, okay? Go to pass one. And uh, when I say start, what you have to do is go to T1, the table 1. Huh? Keep adding 3 successively. There is 1 already. In the next cell, you should write 1 plus 3, 4. Next, 4 plus 3, 7. 7 plus 3, 10. Like that. You keep on writing that, yeah, row or column, whichever is com convenient to you. Uh, you keep writing until I say stop. Is that clear? Okay? Okay, don't start. I'll, I'll give the timer. Okay, on your mark, get set, start. Keep adding three successively. Okay, stop. Okay, now on the same page, now when I say start, you have to go to the T2, table 2 below, and you have to keep adding 4 successively now. 1 plus 4, 5, 5 plus 4, 9. Like that, you have to keep on adding until I say stop, okay? Don't start yet. Instruction is clear, right? Okay, on your mark, get set, start. Okay, stop. Okay, now you add how many numbers you wrote by putting from both the tables. Write that count below. There is a place to write. How many numbers you wrote on that page? Write that count from both the tables put together. You don't have to compare with your neighbor. 
it is not a competition with neighbor, it will be a competition with yourself actually. Okay, done, anybody need calculator? <laughs> because we are, we have become so. <laughs> okay, now turn the page, that is pass 2. Okay, here it is the same table if you notice. Uh, what we do, do now in this round is, when I say start, you have to keep adding 3 and 4 alternatively. You have to go to table 1 first, add 3, come to table 2, add 4, go back to table 1, add 3, come to table 2, add 4. You have to keep on adding 3 and 4 alternatively. Yeah, until I say stop, okay? Hold on, I have to set the timer. Instruction is clear, right? You have to keep on adding 3 and 4 alternatively, okay? Okay, attention here. Any, any questions? Okay, fine. Okay, on your mark, get set, start. Keep adding 3 and 4 alternatively. Okay, stop. Okay, now again count how many numbers you wrote on this page and write it below. Uh, is there a drop from round 1 to round 2? Can you approximately calculate how much percentage drop? Okay. Certainly some drop, right? Oh, okay, that means in the first round you did very poorly. <laughs> That's another question I'll come. In fact, where is you are likely to make more mistake in the second round? In fact, this. Uh, has an impact on the age also, okay? Youngsters will do much better than aged people. <laughs> okay, so what happened? Actually, I gave same amount of time. In the first round, I gave 30 seconds, 30 seconds. In the second round, I gave 60 seconds. What happened? Why the drop happened? Yeah, see in operating system, you might have studied about task switching. Whenever there is a task switching, there is a loss, latency, all those kind of things, right? Very similar thing happened here. In fact, in the first round, I simulated two sequential process in your CPUs. In the second round, I simulated two concurrent process in your CPUs. Just by two concurrent process, our productivity dropped 30 to 50 percent. Isn't it amazing? Are you aware of this? This is bottom of the iceberg. So we don't pay attention. Now let me ask a question, where does software happen? Where does software happen? Huh? Does it happen on computer? Yeah, it happens in people's mind. Not in one mind, it happens in collective minds. Computer is just a tool to capture whatever we are thinking, right? It's a tool, it helps in certain things. Now pay attention to this, a software engineer comes to office, how many processes will be running in that, in that person's head? 
whatever happened at the home, whatever happened in the traffic, all this is running something. And who told what in the office, feedback from manager, some comment from the peer, so many things running, not just two concurrent process. Now think of what is the productivity level of that CPU. Now if you are a manager, how can you improve that productivity? And you as a manager as well is going through so many things in your head. First you have to become aware of that, even in order to deal with that, right? Are you getting it? So now, I talked about that. Software production system, where does software happen? In people's mind and collective minds, in, okay? And what is the raw material for software? No, mind is not raw material. Mind is the transformation engine. What is the raw material? Huh? Ah, problem, idea, requirements. All those things are actually raw material, right? And we are converting that into some finished product. Knowledge, idea, etc. Who is the supplier of raw material? Hmm, excellent point. Do you see this? It's a very, very important paradigm. Customer is also a supplier in our context. In most of the other industries, supplier is different, customer is different. Here, customer is also supplier. They are generating ideas, requirements. Of course, we are also generating. Are you getting this paradigm? So, in software engineering, unlike other engineering disciples, we are dealing with intangibles like knowledge as raw material and idiosyncratic human beings as transformation engines. Do you see this? They are not stereotype machines. Each one is unique. And this machine's characteristics changes from morning to evening. Based on who said what, what happened, what mood I am in. Huh? And in our context, every day the machines walk out of the shop floor come back next morning, changed. Are you getting it? They interact with family, social context, lot of things happening in the mind. So daily stand-up is actually setting up the shop floor. Something like that. So in other engineering disciplines, we are dealing with physical objects and phenomena where there are laws of physics governing principle. Here, there is no loss of physics governing the principles of transformation from raw material to finished product. We are dealing with intangibles, we are dealing with idiosyncratic human beings as the transformation engine, not stereotype machines. And these machines, even if you tune, next day they change. If you, if you actually pay attention to these paradigms, we can reinvent the way of doing software actually. We call this knowledge era paradigms. We have 200 and, or 300 years of industrial era, which is heavily influencing us, conditioning us actually. So most important factor for productivity quality, what is that? In our context, engagement of mind. How much is my mind is engaged? See, you may see that an engineer comes to office and sits in the office for eight hours and logs a time, eight hour time sheet, but that person's mind was disturbed somewhere else. Do you think that's an eight hour productivity? Absolutely not. It's not my physical presence which is actually contributing, it is my mental presence. How much is mind is engaged in doing this transformation? And what impacts that engagement of mind? Any quick comments? What impacts this engagement of mind? Huh? Peace of mind, okay? Distractions, very big, very big impact. Process in the mind, lot of thoughts. Emotions, it's a huge impact, right? For example, if I'm very pleasant state, so much productivity happens. If I'm upset with so many things, I can't even you know? So, lot of things, clarity of vision, emotions, positive energy, you know, someday you get up, you feel very exuberant, great productivity that day. 
workplace distractions it is so much nowadays motivation huge factor you know if i am not motivated i can't even apply my mind to work interactions with people who says what right mind capacity we'll come to that little while maybe i'll just talk about it now. any idea how many thoughts we get per day medical research shows that we get about 50000 to 70000 thoughts per day in fact you can experiment if you just observe your mind for 2 minutes you can then extrapolate actually and how many of those thoughts are useful 99% of the thoughts are useless they are basically something of the past you know why did i do that why did person said that i should have done this whatever or something of the future fear anxiety what if this happens hardly 10% in the present moment so we are oscillating between this so there is a huge amount of loss happening actually here and we are not paying attention to that who is responsible for all these things absolutely it's happening in my mind how can anybody control that right if a manager has to control that what's happening in somebody's mind manager has to constantly keep asking what's happening in your head what's happening in your head <laughs> so onus on individuals is the highest because they also bring the family social context into work we can't just separate that you know i can't plug and play something other device there right onus on others managers customers peers partners subordinates they all influence on how my mind how my emotions gets impacted but most important point to pay attention here is i am one of those others for somebody else do you see that if you get that teamwork will happen automatically we call this empathy basically right onus on organization you know workplace design organization policy organization design all have certain impacts so that's why there is so much emphasis on self managed individuals self managed teams you know time boxing focus prevent interference remove obstacles in fact agile has lot of understanding of the mind but it's not brought out explicitly now do you see connections lot of those because we are dealing with mind because software happens in people's mind so what brings agility in an enterprise context i'm taking this metaphor you know iceberg 10% visible 90% invisible what moves the iceberg not the wind outside but the undercurrents move the iceberg which is not so visible right very similar way what is visible part of agile any thoughts practices ceremonies tools metrics all those kind of things right these are all the visible part of agile and as you can see this is just 10% and they don't really move the iceberg where do you put our effort but in the organization entire thing is on this what about the invisible part of agile mindset culture values principles how is the communication what is the motivation level of people and team vision collaboration self organization facilitative leadership in fact we call those three as the cornerstones of agility that's why i put it a different color there and if you look at all this top of the iceberg they are iq oriented they are dealing with information knowledge you can train people easily bottom is eq oriented emotional intelligence it requires behavior change it requires mindset change and we call the top as doing agile bottom as the being agile and we say mindset is more important than tool set and we say top is lagging indicator bottom is leading indicators you know lagging and leading indicators lagging indicator means it's post facto for example a leading indicator means it indicates into the future for example if there is a demotivation in somebody or in the team you can be sure that it will hit the outcome there you know 
poor artifact, affects the metrics, affects the schedule, quality, you know all those things. But that will be too late. If you are managing only by metrics, you are dealing with top of the iceberg and lagging indicators. If you are able to sense this bottom motivation, energy in the teams and people, you are dealing with leading indicators actually. So, to develop this, you need emotional intelligence and mindfulness is the practical way to develop emotional intelligence. That is what I am going to show now. And this is how you drive results from inside out. This is what brings agility. We keep on, you know, working on the top of the iceberg, still we do not get results. We do, we then we say agile does not work because we are not paying attention to the bottom of the iceberg. And when I say leadership, I am referring to not some hierarchical part, okay. I am talking about leadership as a quality at all levels, right from team member to CXO level. So, we call this agile leadership canvas and this is what needs to be addressed in the enterprises. I will pause for a while here, any questions, comments on so far? How many of you are here, raise hand? Okay, I wanted you to make sure that not just physically, mentally also here. Okay. I talked about emotional intelligence there, right? You might have heard about this emotional intelligence, right? Daniel Goleman, who actually brought out in a very significant way. Until early 90s, people thought that people with high IQ become very successful in life. And then through his research, Daniel Goleman showed that people with high EQ become successful in life. That is why EQ is greater than IQ. And he defined EQ in these five terms. Self-awareness is the core of that, self-regulation, self-motivation, empathy and social skills. I will not go into the details, you can read those literatures and these are called the bedrock of leadership. If you look at any leadership aspect, they stem from here. And there are a lot of neuroscience research now, uh, so it says, shows how the brain works, how the neuro, neural system works. Uh, for example, left brain is all about IQ aspects logic, analysis, linear thinking, sequential thinking, mathematics, logic, language, computation, all these kind of things. Whereas, right brain is all about creativity, imagination, intuition, visualization, all these aspects. Where do you think our education system is? Very heavy left orientation, right? <laughs> yeah, in fact, nowadays parents send their children to compensate for this art class, dance class, music class, sports, which is actually the EQ side. Of course, some schools are trying to bring a little bit of that, but there is no time for them actually. Now, imagine we are heavily conditioning ourselves into IQ orientation. In fact, in our education system, we filter out EQ people because they can't pass exams. Only IQ people can pass exams. Do you know where the EQ people go? Exactly, they become politicians. You, you look at, politicians are not highly educated degree holders, but they have tremendous capacity to deal with complexity, deal with masses, mobilize diverse set of people. They have high EQ actually. And high EQ people come and rule the IQ people. That is the power of EQ. So, we are getting high IQ people, high IQ people as the product into organization, then we expect them to be behaving like EQ people. That is the struggle actually. Ah, <laughs> exactly. Yes. In fact, you, you can see that uh, in, in teams, you can see some people who are not great in technically but they bring something magic in the team. They can bring high energy in the team, uh, jovial, uh, you know, team building, many things. Actually, they are EQ people, but again, they get filtered out in the performance management system because performance management system is also IQ oriented. Data, goals, and soft things they can't measure, so I can't rate you on that. Do you see in this? 
problem. In fact, such team members will become great leaders, but unfortunately they get eliminated. So if managers and leaders become aware of this, you can actually deal with that in a different way. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we do a lot of coaching. I'll, I'll come to that little in a while. We are doing a lot of leadership coaching. After, you know, 30, 40 years, the highest number of coaching conversations is about leading self. How do I deal with myself? My emotions, my insecurities, uh, my relationships. You will be surprised. 70% of our coaching conversation is on that. Who are great leaders in the organization? Can you imagine that? I'll come to that in a little while. So now the Western science and management is figuring out there are what are called multiple leaderships or multiple intelligences. Have you heard of decision making with head, heart and gut? In fact, uh, once we interviewed Ashok Sutta in Mindtree and asked him, how do you make choices and decisions? He said, I make choices and decisions with head, heart and gut. Head is all intellectual, data, analysis, you know, all those aspects. Then heart is emotions. He said, I look at then what's the impact on people. Then ultimately, I go, go by the gut feel, which is intuitive intelligence. But we have paid over attention to intellectual intelligence. We think we can solve everything by only thinking because of our education. Whereas now, people are saying there are many other intelligences. In fact, there is a Harvard re, um, book on multiple intelligences. So how to develop holistic intelligence? Do you see the connection I'm drawing? from agility and begins in the mind, how to deal with mind and how the neuroscience is actually showing us many things. Hope you are able to connect those dots. So this left brain is intellectual intelligence, right brain is emotional intelligence and there are parts of the brain called basal ganglia, it's related to intuitive intelligence. Have you experienced intuitive intelligence? See many times you may struggle to solve some problem, it doesn't come. Suddenly when you are taking bath or when you get up from morning, suddenly flash of an idea comes. Has that happened to you? That's actually coming from that place. Eureka moments. Absolutely. The, you know, the Archimedes, Newton, all those great ideas actually happened when people were actually in that mode. So how to develop that? See, this is thinking mind. And we are conditioned so much on this. Entire education, problem solving, everything is about by thinking. Whereas this part is the opposite. It's about calming the mind. To access this intelligence, you need to silence this overthinking mind. That's what happens when you are actually very relaxed. When you are taking bath, when you are getting up from sleep, when you are in a very relaxed state, when this is quietened, that's when you get great ideas, creative ideas. Now it's happening accidentally, you can actually by design do that, because you can by design quieten this, there are methods. So when you quieten this, these intelligences surface out. And that is the way mindfulness helps actually. Mindfulness is the way to quieten this mind and develop these two minds or intelligences. Make sense? So what is mindfulness? So I want to show you about this Google. Have you heard of this search inside yourself? Google created a program called search inside yourself. See Google has been searching outside, right? Now they are saying search inside yourself. <laughs> it's a leadership development program. Uh, right from engineers to senior levels. It deals with mindfulness practices, emotional intelligence and neuroscience. They tied up with Stanford University to do the neuroscience research. See, Google basically saw that if you have to drive innovation, you need to dive, drive diversity in teams. 
If there is homogeneity, there is no innovation. If everybody thinks alike, there is no innovation, right? When there is diverse set of ideas, diverse set of people coming together, innovation happens. If you want to bring diverse set of people together, they need emotional intelligence. Otherwise, there is conflict. People don't work on each other's ideas. There is ego clashes. So they need high emotional intelligence. So they saw how to develop then emotional intelligence. You can't develop emotional intelligence in an intellectual way by just talking about the EQ model and framework and conducting a training, people don't transform because emotions are a higher drive than the intellect. It overtakes the intellect. So they saw mindfulness practices actually change in the brain and nervous system and hormones and make people higher emotional intelligence people. They bring a transformation, not just I have to remember to self-regulate, empathize, etc. That is the power. In fact, because it became a scientific evidence-based, it became very popular. A lot of companies started adopting it. Then Google spun it off as a search inside yourself leadership institute, silly.org. You can look up to that. There are a lot of published material on that. We did some joint programs from PM Power Consulting along with Google uh, for Indian corporates. It was great success. Then we have created our own framework, which I'm going to share in a little while. In fact, now many of the organizations have internal trained coaches on my uh, search inside yourself, actually. So now I'm getting into that mode on the mindfulness. Okay, so we'll be doing some small activities. I want you to participate, have less resistance, experiment, and then you can figure out later, okay? And uh, where is this? Oh, here. See, I'll be using this bell for starting some activity and stopping some activity, okay? Whenever I ring this bell, you have to start an activity. When I ring this bell again, you should stop the activity. So first one, you know, when I ring this bell, I want you to close your eyes and just observe what thoughts are coming in your mind, okay? You can just sit relaxed, just sit relaxed, close your eyes, close your eyes. Just observe what thoughts are coming in your mind. Okay. If I leave some more time, people will go to sleep, so I just rang the bell. <laughs> End of the day, tired, so body says, okay, let me take full rest. Any thoughts did you observe? And may not also, I'll tell you why. You know, mind is very tricky. When you say, I want to observe mind, all thoughts will vanish actually. You will become blank. So you have to catch the mind red-handed. You know, once in a while suddenly peep in, you will see there are so many thoughts actually. Okay? Because this now observe thoughts itself is a meditation technique actually. You automatically quieten your mind if you just do that. But I wanted to, want you to experiment it. Once in a while you just peep in, you will see there are so many thoughts in the mind. I said 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts, right? So how to reduce those thoughts? Huh? Let go. Yeah, easier said than done actually. But that's really great. So, uh, see in a computer, if there are too many processes are running, what happens? It slows down, right? Even if you hit a key, it will respond after some time. Very similar thing happens. If there are too many processes are running here, we will slow down in our sense and respond. We said agility is about sense and respond. We actually slow down. 
So how to kill here unwanted tasks? In computer, you can go to task manager, click, 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 call the task, say kill. Is there something like that? We'll come to that. There is some technique. But if you say, oh, I'm getting too many thoughts, I want to reduce thoughts, you are already generated new thoughts. It's a trap actually. That's how you can get frustrated. You can get actually more stressed. Mind works in an indirect way. See, body, you can give command, raise hand, leave it, it works. For mind, if you say, don't think, it will think more. You can experiment, no? Let's, next one minute, can we all stop thinking? You can't, it will think more. So you need indirect approach for mind, actually. We'll come to that. Some more experiments now, OK? Now, when I ring this bell, I want you to close your eyes and observe outside any smell, sound, anything, OK? You can take when the whole thing comes, because there are more points coming up. <laughs> yeah, when taking picture, at the end of the slide, you can take. OK, uh, again, sit relaxed. OK, sit relaxed. Close your eyes. Observe outside, whatever all you can observe. Okay, open your eyes. What did you observe? Bell vibration was continuing, AC, somebody. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good. That means you're all are awake. Okay, the next one, when I ring this bell, I want you to close your eyes and observe within yourself what all you can observe, okay? Can you do the experiment? Okay, close your eyes and observe within yourself. Okay, open your eyes. What did you observe this sound? Huh? Okay. Heartbeat, okay, good. Breathing, you observe breathing, okay. Anything else? Neck pain, yeah. You are, you are actually now hearing body. Body is saying so many things and you are busy, not listening. <laughs> okay, anything else? Anybody observe some thoughts coming? Huh? Okay. <laughs> great. Ah, great. <clears throat> so now some more questions. In this round, did you hear the noise that you heard in the first round? Not so much, right? But it was still on. There was some more noise from outside, there was AC was on, nice. We didn't hear that, right? Now, more importantly, in the first round, did you observe that you are breathing, heart was beating? No, but I'm sure it was happening, right? So what does this mean? That means we have some capacity. It's called on-demand attention. I can become fully aware of what's happening around me or I can become very aware of what's happening within me. And with little bit practice, you can do both simultaneously. You can be fully aware what's happening within you, what emotions are coming up, what thoughts are coming up, how am I, what I'm saying, how am I interacting, how other people are responding. I can become very aware of all these things. This is called superpower actually. Can you imagine all relationships, all communication, everything is actually dependent on that. 
So it's called on-demand attention. It's almost like a torch. You know, you put a torch there, it becomes visible. You put a torch inside, it becomes visible. So we have this capacity. So now let's look at what is mindfulness and why it's called superpower. I'll play a small video. Can you increase volume a little bit? You may have heard this word, huh. mindfulness. It's, it's, okay. it's become something of a buzz phrase of late. So I'm going to give you one simple, serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you, rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. So what's mindfulness? <laughs> okay. Huh? Yeah, it's a superpower, but what what does what makes it superpower? Awareness, yeah. Yeah. So I would say this is the kind of a definition for mindfulness. Mindfulness is about being in the present moment with full awareness of what is happening within oneself, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and outside situations, people, and responding wisely and consciously rather than reacting compulsively. That's essentially about mindfulness. Yeah. So this is the framework we have created. I talked about, we did joint programs with Google, and then we saw, because the origin is from India, <laughs> But only thing is, it has to come from the West for us to wake up, unfortunately. So uh, this is basically we say doing mindful and being mindful. Doing mindful is sense and respond with you know self-regulation and empathy. I won't go into the details. And being mindful is about aware outside, aware inside. We did those small activities, right? How to increase our awareness. And this is by becoming more calm. And we call this, that's how managing outside by mastering inside. That means the more complex situations and people we have to deal with outside, we need more inner mastery. So that's essentially about mindful leadership. This typically a one day workshop that we do for this entire framework. So today I just want you to get one flavor of it. You know, we'll do one, we'll learn one technique today, very simple, but it's extremely powerful. Okay, it will be a take home for you. <laughs> Are you all ready? 
So now again I will play an audio clip, uh, you have to sit relaxed with your back and head straight and follow the audio instructions. Excuse me, uh, you have to increase the volume little bit here, okay. Okay, sit relaxed with your head and you know back straight and follow this audio. Sit relaxed with your back and head straight, close your eyes, bring your attention to the breath, start observing your breath. Breathe slowly and deeply with full inhalation and full exhalation. Keep observing the breath. Observe the sensations in the nostrils as you breathe in and breathe out. Observe the slight movement of the nostrils as you breathe in and breathe out. Observe the movement of chest and abdomen as you breathe in and breathe out. Continue to observe the breath. If any thoughts come, don't follow the thoughts, gently bring back the attention to the breath. Continue to observe the breath. Slowly and gently open your eyes.
हेलो हेलो ओके सो हाउ डिड यू फील रिलैक्सड एनी अदर एक्सप्रेशन या यू फील क्वाइटनिंग लाइटर बिकॉज माइंड हैज अ बिग इम्पैक्ट ऑन बॉडी एक्चुअली वेन माइंड कम्स डाउन यू फील लाइटर इन द बॉडी सो वॉट हैपन एक्चुअली इज दैट लॉट ऑफ थॉट्स गॉट रेड्यूस्ड इन यूर माइंड वी आर थिंकिंग अबाउट हाउ टू रेड्यूस थॉट्स राइट इफ इज आई आई वॉन्ट टू रेड्यूस थॉट यू विल क्रिएट मोर थॉट this is the way to reduce thought actually so automatically in a sense you take the attention of the mind to something else but taking attention to breath has many benefits which is out of syllabus for this course actually uh so you will but you can experience its impact it's as simple as that only thing is whenever you start this after a while again mind will creep in you know you you would have wandered to something else whenever such thing happens you can just notice that thought and just come back to observing breath if you say oh i'm getting distracted you are getting into the trap because i'm getting distracted is another thought you you will fall into that trap oh i'm not able to concentrate oh no i'm not able to meditate again these are all traps because you are creating more thoughts can you activate the caller mic hello okay okay L- leave it then so this is a very simple technique but extremely powerful and now neuroscience shows what all happens actually in the brain nervous system hormones etc so mindfulness impacts very quickly uh there is a lot of personal well being reduced stress anxiety you can already see quietening you know relaxation etc right and reduce see when you say stress it's basically too many thoughts in the head the moment you do that your stress starts coming down anxiety why does anxiety happens because of some fear fear is actually a you know it's a negative projection of the future by the mind it's not real you can actually reflect on that you know if you see something in the past you thought at that time oh my god this is a very big problem now if you look back you'll say ah oh, after all it was not such a big issue when it's in front of us it gets magnified by this mind and the body hormones you know negative cycle and gets amplified that's what causes anxiety actually See the moment you do this, it's like pulling the plug out. Actually, you will get more relaxed and less anxiety. Improved physical, mental health. In, in fact, why physical health improves? In fact, we have done a lot of this program, more than thousand. Actually, we have covered about six thousand five hundred people across multiple companies, and we do a survey after six weeks of practice. We teach many more techniques actually in one day workshop. and people have come back and shared lot of things including their physical health improvement why physical health improves any idea yeah in fact mind has a very big impact on body now actually medical science knows that 80 to 90% of diseases are psychosomatic caused by mind that's what happens with personal well being personal effectiveness on demand attention focus we saw that right professional performance more productive because i'm cl- decluttering my mind i'm able to you know get into the productive mode more social connect better relationships why relationships improve because now i'm able to pay attention to others and i respond to them better when we respond to people they respond in a better way that's how the relationship improves actually and people have come back and shared all these things in our survey data now there is lot of neuroscience evidence showing why this happens this is google stanford research i'm showing some of those reports one of the things they saw is that how the brain wave frequency changes you know the eeg electroencephalograph 
normally it will be in between 15 to 30 cycles per second, what's called beta state. And when you do a little bit of this mindfulness practice, just like breath watch, etc., it comes down to around 7 to 15 cycles per second. It comes down, the frequency comes down. And if you do deeper meditation, it goes to theta state, which is about 3 to 7 cycles per second. So what's the significance of bringing down this brainwave frequency? You know, if you are buying a computer or a mobile phone, if you notice the specification, there is something called clock speed. Have you observed that? 2.2 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. And higher the clock speed, higher the power consumption and higher the heat dissipation. Very similar thing happens. If your CPU is running at a high frequency, your entire metabolism will be at a high gear. Many times we think, I go to sleep, but next morning I, I get up, I still don't feel fresh, I feel tired. Because in sleep what happens is input-output is shut down, but the CPU and memory are still active, unless you get a very deep sleep. It's almost like you have parked the car, but it's running at a high RPM, uh, you know, RPM engine. So you get up in the morning, you still don't feel fresh. So what this does is actually relax this whole brainwave frequency and the entire metabolism and the body. And if anybody is curious, you can do experiment. This headset is available in Flipkart and Amazon for 10,000 rupees. You can wear it. You can do this practice and see how it changes your brainwave frequency on your laptop, actually. They have seen some more of these uh, hormones, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, opiates, etc. These are called pleasantness hormones, happiness hormones. Uh, you know, this antidepressant, dopamine. Batteries draining, end of the day. <laughs> so, uh, they saw that these hormones improve in the body. That means if you produce more dopamine, you will not feel depression. In fact, when you go to doctor and you know, say stress and depressed, etc., they give antidepressants, basically. And oxytocin is called pleasantness hormone. That means if you produce more oxytocin, you will, please, you will feel happy unconditionally. See, right now we have made our happiness conditional, isn't it? If I get this, I'll be happy. If this happens, then I'll be happy. If this person reacts to me like this, then I'll be happy. It's a if-then-else. And we constantly postpone happiness, isn't it? Rather than that, if you are happy, you will be more effective in whatever you are doing. Then results come, etc., which add on to the happiness. So this is a better way to actually create more happiness. Serotonin is called self-esteem confidence hormone. If you produce more serotonin, you will have less fear. In fact, people have come back and shared in our survey, now I feel more confident just by doing these practices, you know. So this is the impact of these hormones. And they also studied what happens in the brain. There is part of the brain called amygdala in the center, which is part of the limbic system. And it is responsible for survival instincts. You know, fight or flight instinct. You might have heard about fight or flight. For every situation, we'll be thinking whether should I run away from this or should I fight this. That was very useful when we were in jungles as animals because anytime a prey can jump and I need to protect myself. But now we are in a social condition, much safer, but still it's very active. And the threats it feels is not the physical threat. Somebody criticizes me. Somebody comments on me. Or I myself figure, think that, oh, what will happen? What will somebody think of? All these things, it thinks as a threat. And when it thinks as a threat, it actually triggers this, what's called fight or flight instinct. On the other hand, there's a part of the brain called neocortex, which is called higher thinking awareness brain. So what they saw by this practice is that it reduces the gray matter in amygdala and increases the gray matter in neocortex. That means we naturally become less reactive, more responding. It's not by I need to remember and think and act. I transform into that person, you know, type of a person.
I'm just looking at time. Okay. So, I can share one my personal example. Way back in my career, at the start of my career, I was a hardcore techie. What I mean by that is, I was very comfortable with computer, very uncomfortable with people. So, when I'm alone, my entire CPU memory input output is in great form. I get great ideas. Moment I go to meeting, almost shut down. I won't even speak in the meeting. Then I come out and say, oh, I should have said this. I had the, all the ideas. Again and again, I then, then brood over that. I was not able to come out of that. Then when I reflected, I noticed why it was happening was that I had a lot of fear. Fear of failure, fear of making mistake, fear of criticism, fear of losing face. When I'm alone, this is perfectly running fine. Moment I'm with people in that kind of situations, in the meeting, etc., 50% of my bandwidth is taken away by that fear. I become very ineffective. I became aware of that, but still I was not able to come out of that. When I started many of these yogic practices, something dramatically changed. I actually transformed into a different person. You won't believe I could talk like this, actually. And later, when I started studying neuroscience, I could relate that what actually happened. Probably things changed in the brain and nervous system and endocrine system. I actually transformed into a different person rather than trying to, you know, remember and behave differently. It really very, very powerful. So there are a lot of you now case studies. Many organizations have published. For example, Athena is an insurance company. These are little old data, but there are many more reports are available. Uh, they saw 28% reduction in stress levels in employees, 20% improvement in sleep quality, one hour per week productivity improvement. General Mills, they saw decision-making improvement in leaders and listening skills. In Intel, they saw stress levels coming down, happiness and well-being improving, in, and clarity and creativity in improvements, and many, many things like this. So this is what, that's why we say that if you have to drive agility from the root, you go to that place. Because mindfulness drives emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence drives this mindset, culture, leadership qualities. That drives the top of the iceberg, the actions and results. This is driving agility from inside out. So if you have to do this, you have to develop leadership skills. So we call this developing full stack leaders. You might have heard of full stack engineers, right? We say developing full stack leaders. Full stack leaders address all these aspects. Leading business, which is the outer manifestation. In order to lead business, they have to lead people because everything happens through people. And in order to lead people, they should be able to lead themselves first. How do I deal with my own emotions, thinking process, my own behaviors, you know? So leading self, we call this as intrinsic leadership. It's very core within us. Leading people, we call this extrinsic leadership. And leading business, we call it as applied leadership. You use these two bottom of the iceberg leadership skills and apply it into a field of business or technology or anything. And that's how you drive results. So it's a doing and being. And all these three levels need a different approach of learning. Problem is, in the corporate world, anything development, we think of training. Training is good if it's IQ-oriented. But below this is EQ, and this is MQ, mindfulness quotient. So to develop this, you can do training on the IQ oriented, because you are disseminating information, knowledge, techniques, tools. Below that, EQ needs coaching, because people need reflection, and somebody to hold the feedback and mirror. There are many times there are blind spots. I don't even know that I am behaving like that, actually. And to develop self, leading self, you need to guide self-inquiry. You know, people need to go within themselves and figure out what drives me, what puts me off, what motivates me, what are my limiting beliefs, what are my aspirations and vision. They have to go within themselves. In fact, we do these leadership programs, which is typically about four months to six months program for a batch of 20 people. 
and many workshops with interspersed one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. And very surprisingly, all these are very successful leaders in the organization. And 70% of coaching conversations on, are on leading self. Can you imagine that? Because people are struggling with that. I don't know how to deal with myself. Because we have missed that segment completely in our education. In the name of secularism, we actually killed our education system of all those practices. Unfortunately. And people are at the age of 40, 50 years, they are coming and thinking, how should I deal with myself? 70% of coaching conversations are on these topics, actually. So that is about mindful leadership for agility. That means you develop leadership skills in team members to CXO level everywhere, full stack leaders. And that's how you can really drive agility, not just by the top of the iceberg. So I'll end my presentation with a small video. Shall I play a video? Yeah. And it's just a two and a half minute video. Just watch this. It could be very useful in our lives. We can meditate everywhere, anytime. Even three seconds, two seconds, while you're walking, while you're having coffee and tea, while you're having a meeting, so you can meditate. Many people have a little bit of misunderstanding about meditation. They think meditation meaning think of nothing, concentrate. <laughs> so push too much. So we cannot block thought and emotion. In fact, we need thought and emotion. So whether you listen to your monkey mind or not, that's an issue. What I call monkey mind, mind is chatting, you know, pala 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 yada yada. So monkey mind is giving your opinion. So whether you listen to opinion or not, it's up to you, right? So through meditation, what we do is we have to make friends with the monkey mind. But how to make friends? Just giving banana doesn't work, you know. <laughs> so right method is you need to give job to monkey mind. How to give job monkey mind? So the simple meditation technique is be aware of the breath. So you ask monkey mind, hello, what's breath? So monkey mind says, ah yeah, good idea. And be aware of breath. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. There's a lot of thought comes at the background. Don't care, no problem. So as long as if you're not forget your breath, anything is okay. No need too much concentration. Just simply be aware of your breath. Breathe in, out, in. Even two breath, one breath. So therefore, we can meditate everywhere, anytime. In fact, for this, you don't have to even close your eyes. Can you all do that? As you are watching me, you can observe your breath. Just take your attention to breath. Hello? Are you able to hear me? OK, OK. So this is called stealth operation. Even in a meeting, you can actually take your attention to breath. Nobody else will notice. You can manage your emotions and thoughts very effectively. Just experiment it. It works very, very powerfully. So you can prevent yourself getting hijacked emotionally and then you know, damaging many things. So with that, thank you very much. Hope this was a relaxation session at the end of the day. And I'll be happy to interact. If anybody is interested, you can send me a mail. Uh, we can be engaging conversations further as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, if there are some questions, I can take. Yeah, people are in deep meditation. <laughs> <laughs> this entire yogic science is an Indian powerful science. Do you see that in our education system? That is the way to deal with self actually. It has all the techniques and tools. That is eliminated from our education. Huh? 
Okay. Sanskrit poem recitation, all these particular things. Okay. But that has not been. I mean, you mean to say those things are eliminated now? How much of that is there? I'm just questioning how much. For example, how much we focus on IQ versus how much on EQ? And to develop EQ, there are so many of these techniques, mm -hmm. and they are not brought into practice in our education. No. Okay. That's what I'm highlighting. Right. I mean, when people, leaders obviously would have gone through kind of this understanding or like you said, many politicians are uh, EQ people, right? Uh, they would have definitely might bring it back. No, no, no. Some education. of them naturally somehow develop that. Mm -hmm. But there are now techniques and tools which everybody can actually develop. Just like I said, I was in a, what I called as pure techie, mm -hmm. you know, and how would I transformed. It was very useful for me. And... When I transformed, it also impacted people around me, my wife and children and my friends and relationships, because they saw I, I am changing and their responses started changing. So there is so much of power in that actually. And I have gone through that personally from a transformation. That's why I'm sharing that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, thanks for the uh, amazing uh, presentation. So, Thank my you. question was, uh, we in a corporate world, we generally, any manager or let's say XYZ designated man, so we always uh, think of a concept called selective replies. So, it could be meant in even event to email or anything for that matter. So, we thought, we spoke about three uh, uh, what do you call, say, MQ, EQ, and IQ, right? Mm -hmm. So, which part of this that comes into play? That scenario I'm talking about, that use case, uh, specifically. Yeah, when you say selective, is it by intention or by not knowing? Uh, see, as a, as a professional, probably I would like to map it up with the priorities. That's my way of handling that case. So, mm -hmm. I would just want to know, like, how do we look at it from a neuroscience point of view? Yeah. Uh, I would say it's not so much of neuroscience. For example, if it's purposely, I suppress something, you know, then it's a manipulation. On the other hand, I'm doing it unknowingly, then it's a lack of empathy, which is actually about EQ. So depending on that, actually, I need to work. So it's more about, rather than analyzing and judging somebody, it's about how am I right now, and how can I transform? In fact, in our leadership program, we keep on bringing people to working on self because people always think that as a leader, I mean, I need to go and fix people outside. I need to fix all those people. I need to influence all those people. They think that it's about outside, but it's actually inside. Leadership development is actually about transforming myself. So we need to keep bringing back to that. So in, even in that, I would recommend you to reflect on yourself rather than somebody else of your manager or team member, etc. That will be a lot more useful. Did I answer? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're talking about that uh, headset, right? This yeah. Meditation. What, what headset is that? Uh, <clears throat> you can search for uh, EEG headsets, electroencephalograph. Oh. Yeah. Uh, first, of, first of all, uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, session. Thank you. And uh, is exam time for the children's now? Yeah. Okay. Always pressurizing the kids. Okay. And uh, and also pressurizing them, and we are also getting stressed. Yes. More. Uh, at the end of the session, I think uh, what I was doing is wrong, I felt. Okay. Now, it's the uh, takeaway uh, to the home is that uh, EQ, IQ, I think this is all, uh, this is a mismatch in our society or with the mismatch with the set of people we have and whatever existing at the education system or what we have 
we need to unlearn and that mindfulness we need to first adopt. I think it's a beautiful session for me at the end of the day for today and personally and professionally uh, yeah. because as a woman, we uh, go in a day with a different mindset of people at family, at uh, office. Uh, I think it was very helpful and it was uh, eye-opener eye for me at least. Thank, thank you, you, thank so you very much. Thank you. In fact, in our ancient Indian education system, Always leading self was the first in the education. That's why it got called, you know, Balya. Then Balya is playfully exploring the world. Brahmacharya was actually mastering our own internal dimensions. And then Grahastha was go out and manage the world outside. Then Vanaprastha Sanyasa. It was extremely beautiful life stages actually. And why, where do you see in our education system the so-called Brahmacharya aspect? I'm not talking about in a religious connotation, but mastering oneself. I'm seeing leaders coming after 40, 50 years of age, thinking about how, how do I deal with myself. That should have been the first education in the child. That's what I'm saying, it's the missing piece. Yep, thank you very much. Yeah. So my reflection, it's a brilliant session, a lot of insights. Um, one of the biggest challenges leaders we really do not know how to deal with difficult people. Hmm. When we are dealing with difficult people, we don't know how to deal with ourselves. Absolutely. At the same time. Absolutely. It's both happening at the same time. We get stressed out. Hmm. And uh, at Salesforce, one of the things as leaders, we all come together and say, we ask one question to everybody else. Uh -huh. Say, if I am a director, when I talk to another director, we will ask this question. Are you taking care of your health? Uh -huh. Are you comfortable are you peaceful in your mind so that's the first conversation wonderful we proactively make this mm. at, at a leadership level mm -hmm. and that changes the maybe in my previous meeting i had a very tough conversation mm. but the next meeting this one question changes the whole game wonderful so i think whatever you said is really valuable yeah, yeah. and uh, thank you so much thank you very much in fact in some organizations we have done this mindfulness transformation right from engineer level to ceo level the entire company and they have routinized some of that. For example, daily stand-up meeting, first two minutes they do breath watch, the whole team. And they have seen the collaboration, the removal of the emotional baggage is so much reduced. And in fact, we come in, uh, do certain uh, sessions for CXO level during the strategy planning session, you know, just 10 minute meditation before they get into strategy planning. And they have seen that their emotional baggage reduces People anxiety reduces, they become much more open and collaborative. So people are seeing those impacts and results actually. By the way, Salesforce is one of the mindfulness adopters, if you have seen, yeah. Yeah. Here, Mike. For others also to listen. Yeah. Thank you so much for enlightening session. I mean, I don't know. Uh, Technical things, we get it from the multiple sources, uh, but this is something different and unique. Uh, that's what uh, I felt personally. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, many things which I'm struggling, right, I got the tips in this. Mm. So I'm going to uh, apply those things. But one thing, it's not a question. So uh, to be aware of that mindfulness, I mean, you have been practicing and uh, helping other people, right? So approximate tenure, uh, when we keep practicing, is there any like after three months or after six months? In after fact, eight uh, six, six weeks is the uh, starting point. If you do some of these practices continuously for six weeks, then you will start seeing the result. In fact, there is a lot of neuroscience research on that as well. What's called neuroplasticity, how the brain starts rewiring and what's called also cellular regeneration. That means we start producing new cells in a better way. That's why the six weeks, which is actually connected to what's called mandala in yogic sciences, which is related to moon cycles. That's a profound science actually behind that. In fact, search inside yourself also, you know, suggests that six weeks of practice, when you start actually seeing that. Uh, best thing is like, my myth was like, when you say that meditation and all those things, okay, you should be calm, close your eyes and everything, but now it's broken. Even though I'm speaking now, I can be cautious. Yeah, wonderful. So thank you for that. Wonderful. In fact, you can go to our website. Uh, we have a mindful leadership session where you can download a free ebook on mindfulness at work, which has more details. And also, there is a whole set of audio video guided practices 
we saw just one practice here. For example, there is another practice through which you can switch off all your thoughts and go to deep sleep at night. Normally, we don't get deep sleep at night because there are a lot of thoughts running in your head. So you can just use them. Uh, These are simple and work profoundly. Okay, I think we're on time. Thank you very much for staying awake. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vishweshwar. Today you took us into a completely new dimension and a new uh, definition, a new meaning of being agile. Thank you so yeah. much for opening it, our eyes. It, it all starts with us, right? You can drive agility, not just in corporate sense, even in our lives. Thank you.